Hello, and welcome to another episode of Hacking with Friends. Today, we are fully live and talking about Docker. My name is Cody Kinsey. I am a security researcher with Veronis, and today I am really excited to have uh, Brett Fisher, a Docker captain, and the host of his own show that teaches about Docker security. Uh, Brett, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm glad to be here, and I can't wait to get into it, because uh, this is one of my favorite topics, Docker and security. Sweet. So I have seen a lot of security tools out there that specify you can install them by Docker. And as somebody who was coming as an absolute beginner, I didn't really understand why this option might be better than anything else until I started looking into the issues that these tools had with them. And it was always people having issues with the operating system they were running or the version of a library they were running or some other thing that kind of made it so the software developer who was trying to put this great piece of software out there actually wasn't able to have it run for very many people. Uh, I kind of learned more about Docker when I started looking for answers to these problems, but I think you'd probably be in a better position than me to explain for a total beginner what Docker is and really why it's necessary or why it's helpful in some of these reason in some of these situations where you might not be able to uh, have the same piece of software run the same way on a bunch of different right. computers. Yeah, I mean it, it spawned out of a little company called Dot Cloud that was. Uh, trying to create a competitor to Heroku and some of these other platforms that basically run apps really easy. Uh, they take the servers out of the mix and allow you to just basically give them source code from like GitHub or something. And they open sourced one of the key components that allowed them to take anyone's app, wrap it up, apply some Linux kernel technologies. We'll talk about these later, but namespaces and C groups were the main two features that were relatively recent in the last decade or so of the Linux kernel and allowed them to isolate apps, which is really important, right? When you're using, when you're deploying multiple applications from different people on the same host, you always wanna make sure isolation is in there. And so they use these new concepts in Linux and then they wrapped a bunch of really easy uh, command line tooling around it and automated a lot of the previously dark art tasks that you know maybe Netflix was using and maybe some advanced companies were using, but us mere mortals didn't really understand all the different layers of this tooling. So they essentially created an automated wrapper around some core Linux technologies to allow you to, I call it the three innovations of Docker. I've been kind of making this term up this year. Um, the first thing it does is it creates your it takes your application whatever that is whether it's java it doesn't matter what it is as long as it runs on linux or windows um it can be put in a container and so it takes that plus every dependency that that application needs so if it's a python app it's got to include python if it uses ssl it's probably going to need open ssl in there um so it's going to have all those dependencies and it's going to package those all up in a common packaging format that's now a standard and we call that an application image or i'm sorry a container image and it contains your application and its dependencies. Now, it doesn't contain drivers or uh, the kernel of the OS. So it doesn't have the low layer hardware components. It only has the application and its app dependencies, right? So it, they did that. They created this, distrib this distributable package. It's essentially a tarball. It's a series of tarballs with some metadata that has your app and all its dependencies. And then they SHA hash it so that they can be certain that it's exactly as it was built. And mm -hmm. then when you put it on another machine, it's identical because it'll shaw hash that to match it. So that's innovation one. The mm -hmm. second one is that they created the idea of running that image as a container. Mm -hmm. So we've had this concept of, especially in Linux for decades about how to isolate applications. We had Solaris zones, we had jails. If you were ever into like Bluehost or those places, they would always run you in a jail or CH root essentially mm -hmm. that would make you think you had root, but you really didn't because you were just one of a thousand people on the machine. And that was the early days before Docker said, well, we're going to take more advanced ideas of that and wrap it all together with some easy command lines. And so what Docker will do is they'll take that image that you had created, they'll download that tarball, and then they'll create all the security parameters to isolate it from the rest of the system so it can't see anything outside of its own little enclave. Mm -hmm. And then it runs it. And because it knows it's identical to the way you built it, because it has all the dependencies, including down to the bit level um, of that. So that was the second innovation. And they really made it easy for developers and operators to understand how to run that with a simple command. Hmm. The third big one was distribution. 
because all of us are using apps everywhere, whether it's on our machine or on servers. And this is largely about server apps and command line apps. I mean, Docker technically isn't the way you would deploy like Microsoft Word to a thousand people, right? It's not really meant for that. It's really meant for servers and command line apps. There are some hacks you can do to kind of get GUIs working, but it's not really a common occurrence. So mm -hmm. think of it as server hard. Like I always tell everybody it's the app, it's the server version for web developers and app developers anywhere. It's the server version of that, like the app store is to Apple or Google because mm -hmm. users are now used to just clicking on an app, it downloads, when they want to get rid of it, they delete the app and it's all gone. And that's really what a Docker container is. And so Docker added that third layer, which was distribution. So all something like Docker Hub is, and we'll talk about that later, but there's this idea of a package registry and these new packages, these new inventions of these container images can be shipped all over the world using HTTPS. And so it really, you have to just run this little app called a registry and there's tons of them out there. Every cloud has one and it stores your container images as tarballs in HTTPS stores, essentially it just makes a web server with storage back in. So now you have the, the way to package it up so that everyone else can run it the way you intend. You can ship it anywhere using easy concepts like Git uses with push and pull. And then the third combo is I can pull that image and run it locally just like the de developer intended with all of the, the uh, dependencies and stuff. So that three step combo there really I think was what back in 2014, what really made it the selling point of it and why it's so, you know, everybody's trying to use it today. So this really solves like a, a series of issues that I run into just trying to teach people really basic stuff, including just maybe a Python program. You think like, okay, I'm going to teach people how to use a basic Python program, but I really need it to work. And then you go to run it and you find out that people's Python installation is messed up or they have an an old version of a particular library that's messing up the entire program and it's not updating for some reason or maybe they even have like some key things locked down on their computer that you don't you don't even know why it's locked down and now you have to go and fix that before you can even run this program and for a beginner this might be just discouraging enough to get them to just not even use the thing that you've built so yeah. one thing that i really like yeah. about docker as i was learning about it is you know Developers, let's say, I, let's say I'm a security researcher. I find a really cool exploit. I weaponize it. I create a proof of concept. And then I maybe even build a framework around it so it's all fancy and other people can use it. And then I put it out there and maybe it's Python based or, or something like that. And right. it relies on a bunch of other stuff though. So it's just pulling the strings of other programs that I've linked together into a really awesome framework. Great. But there's a lot of dependencies. So as soon as somebody else tries to use this, you know, the average person will install it. They'll see that it fails a bunch of times, hopefully get the context clues to install stuff, uh, and it's not very clean. A nicer yeah. developer will include like a, a list of stuff that you need to install, like a requirements.txt. So it's like, okay, that's a step up. At least now I know all the things I'm supposed to install, and provided everything else is perfect, then it should work. But then if we move a step up from that, I see that really good developers will actually include not just like an installation script that ties all that together, but maybe even a Docker image. And the reason for that is once these things get complicated enough or they have enough moving parts or they rely on enough other pieces, it's reasonable to assume that one of them might not be installed correctly on someone else's machine. And that could bring down the entire thing. And of course, there's also security yeah. problems where unless you're reading every single line of code, you have this thing basically interacting with the entirety of your system. And if you are a beginner and maybe you're just starting out with installing some new programs and stuff, you might not want that if you're not fully auditing the code that you're about to install in your system. So what I like about Docker and what, what I think is cool about the concept is as a developer, it gives you the ability to create something that you know exactly how it's gonna run every time, but it's not like you're taking the extreme step of creating a virtual machine freezing it right. and then asking people to download a 12 to 16 gigabyte file just to get the same environment and everything else that that uh, you have. Now, I've, I've seen this kind of played out. And in fact, there are some cool operating systems that are basically based on people setting up a ver something with a bunch of applications all the way they like it and then releasing it as an OS. But it is a huge commitment. It, it has lots of other stuff that could be misconfigured or wrong. And when you add in all this overhead and complexity, it increases the amount of resources you need to run this thing in order to just get a simple program to run consistently. And it also means that all these other things could be misconfigured or be taking up needless resources. So, you know, creating a full virtual machine is a very, very kind of like, it's a good analogy for, for some new people about how Docker works, but it's not the same because it just 
lumps in so many other resources and stuff that it's a much heavier task than just running a container, which is basically a much scaled down, slimmed down version of just what you need to make this one thing run. Yeah, uh, I, I think that I agree with all of that. And I think that, um, well, I, I, when, I, when I'm talking with security teams, right, uh, especially when they're new to the idea of containers, um, once they understand, and I, we, we talk about the core underpinnings of how this technology works, what it's using in the Linux kernel, we're going to focus on Linux today, but this is largely say, the same with Windows. It just has different terminology for how the, the kernel in Windows works and how it uses it, but it functionally, it functionally happens the same way in Windows. Um, that I would, like, give me random internet code, right? And I will run that in a container on my machine without any stress, every day of the week because by default if i run that in a docker container that code unless it's using some sort of linux kernel or docker you know exploit that i have it either patched or it's zero day it's not going to be able to get out of that space into the rest of my machine mm -hmm. so i always talk to people about you know take the regular app you have on a server or the or the thing that you're worried about people running you know because it may not be the best most secure up-to-date thing shove it in a container and you're already improving not just the security of that thing itself by protecting and isolating it a little bit on its own but you're you're definitely and mostly protecting the host from what's in that container because it is contained uh inside this little enclave that has its own ip address its own file system and we've only really seen over the you know five six seven years that it's been around we've only seen a, a couple of big security vulnerabilities that were really putting, you know, sort of throwing Docker under the bus. One of them was Dirty Cal a couple of years ago, probably three years ago. And it had to, had to do with a kernel bug that sort of exposed, it, it allowed you to basically escape the container in a certain scenario. And you, you couldn't do it remotely. It had to be done locally. Um, but it allowed you to basically to elevate privileges outside of a container. And that's obviously something we never want to have happen in Linux. So it's kind of the worst, one of the worst case scenarios with Docker. But I think once people start to read into that and learn that, they start to realize, man, we should run all of our apps this way, you know, compartmentalize them from each other. Our, you know, even though our PHP app and our database might be on the same machine, they don't need to be able to see each other. You know, even if they need to have root for some reason, they don't need to have root together. So let's isolate them, separate them out, and then use either file, what we call file mounts or bind mounts in Linux, or just standard, you know, TCP packets to communicate between the things and then it's it's almost as as secure as isolating in a vm and that's a great that's, conversation to have is like the difference between isolation and vms and containers but that's really cool though because <clears throat> one of the most common arguments i hear from people who don't want to upgrade their security that don't want to patch their systems or, or update stuff is oh we have this super critical thing running and we don't want to update it or we can't update it it's too technical to update it and it has to have some old thing in order to work so we, we don't want to update the rest of our hosts to uh, whatever standard, even though we know it's dangerous because it would be too expensive to get this old thing to be compatible. So like, I feel like if people aren't aware that there's an alternative to just not updating your stuff, like maybe they would be, they would be interested in learning this because I find right. that a lot of people are very fuzzy on the details of like how accessible this technology is and like how much it will be able to upgrade you if you're insisting on running something that can't be upgraded immediately or relies on some older stuff, like it's a way of at least immediately making sure that the rest of your software isn't downgraded for the purpose of like this right. one application that's just critical. Right, yeah, that's absolutely true. Uh, in my courses, I, um, I have a bunch of courses and, and uh, one of the demos we go through is actually doing a database update. And in other words, patching a database version, right? Which if you're a database, if you're someone who has to deal with databases, which hopefully most of us don't, <laughs> um, you know, updating the database server is always a scary task because, you know, is it going to corrupt my data? Is it going to, you know, I can't, you can very rarely, if ever, take the database down. So then you have to usually figure out some way to replicate and do all that stuff. And one of the, te one of the things that we, the students go through is they, they basically swap Docker commands and they delete the container. The date, so the data, in Docker, there's this thing called a volume. So any data that you need to stay persistent will stay outside of the container in a, another enclave called a volume. That's basically a an isolated place on the hard drive of the of the of the host. So you can safely take, let's say, version you know 10.2.1 of MySQL, 
and you can just delete the container because all it is is the application is binary, it's not the data. And then you can replace it with 10.2.2 because that has a new you know, critical vulnerability fix. And you, you didn't, if you run it and you realize, oh, we have to go back to 10.2.1, then you just delete that container and go back to the old version and do this, the same command before. So it's one of those things where a lot of times, and especially on Linux and Windows, where traditional installation methods put files everywhere, all over the place. It's yeah. a scary thing to do updates, especially when you're dealing with operations in production, because it's kind of a permanent act. You, you, you can't easily undo that without worrying about artifacts or some sort of thing that's, you know, you, it never really uninstalls everything, right? But with a container, when you delete a container, it's deleting every last little bit of it other than any persistent data that you've told it to keep around like a database or it even deletes the logs, right? Like how many applications do we have where we delete the application and then the logs are still stuck somewhere filling up the hard drive in the um, system D stuff or in um, the log journals. And with Docker, it keeps all those logs for every application in, the, in some JSON format. And when that when you delete the container, it will delete the logs. So it's very, um, I like that it cleans up after itself way better than any other package management system out there. And, you know, even when you're talking about like things like NPM and, you know, cause even NPM and some of these other application package managers, they might delete, if you delete the app, it might delete all of the downloaded modules, but it probably won't delete the caches of those, which are usually like tarballs or zip files somewhere else in the file system. It's amazing how like these package managers will put stuff everywhere. You don't, you know, you want to clean up after yourself and you can't because it's just, there's a lot of commands you have to learn and weird little settings you have to find. And yeah, it's a mess. Yeah. And honestly, from the security side, I find that malware takes advantage of this because there, you wouldn't believe how much stuff like Adobe installs all over your right. system um, that you never know. Like sometimes I'll get a notice on my computer. It's like Adobe is encrypting files. And I was like, well, why? Like, and it turns out it's doing its update thing. But you know, when you have a, a, a something that's just installed all over your, your computer, it's in all sorts of sensitive areas. You're getting alerts maybe about it doing some sketchy stuff. It's like, you don't know whether or not it's supposed to be doing that all the time, especially maybe if you've been breached and there's some other program that's running you know, a malware attack where it's yeah. trying to ransomware your entire system and like for whatever reason it's encrypting files it shouldn't be. Like the fact that it's all over your system and you can't separate it means that if you download something that decides to ransomware your system, then, you know, it can be hard to know if you're just trying out some software or maybe you found a movie on the internet that uh, you really want to watch. Like there are real risks yep. when it comes to doing stuff on your host system. And the way that normal programs are installed like might not be very secure when it comes to knowing what that particular thing is doing encrypting files in this particular folder. Because that's very like, uh, it's kind of obtuse when it comes to the way most software is installed. Yeah, and when you when you run a default Linux, like let's say you install Ubuntu, right? You turn that thing on and there's 75 binaries running. Right. Mm -hmm. And Windows is probably 200. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I mean, I've been living this stuff for 25 years and I have my ways, but it's it's still really complicated in advance to just look at a list of programs running and go, that one looks kind of funny. Right. right? Yeah. Uh, especially on Linux, where you don't there's not really that I'm aware of any out of the box tools that will give you a list. Well, it's not true. It's true on Windows either. There's no out of the box tools, but for Windows, there's actually some things called sysinternal tools that will actually show you the list of things running or the link and, and also the things that are set to start up automatically. And then if they're digitally signed by a public certificate and then who they're signed by. And mm -hmm. um, we have that on Linux, but it's not really an out of the box tool. Um, in fact, I can't even think of what tool does it, but I know I've seen it. We have um, it for Mac OS as well. Um, if you've ever tried out Patrick Wardle's Objective-C oh, tools. Um, there's I a love of, his stuff. Yeah, they're so good. There's a bunch that show you like things that will start up automatically. It'll check their signatures, and it automatically runs them through VirusTotal to see if anything that it's doing or any processes have been recognized, which is really cool. And again, not out of the box. Yeah, that's a great tip. If you're a, if you're a Mac user, um, look up Patrick on uh, Patreon. I'm, I'm actually a, a supporter of his on Patreon. And... Uh, uh, objective, it's, it's S E E, right? Objective, yep, objective C or C E E or S E E. I can't think of S E E. I think S E E. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, they just he just did a, a big open source Mac firewall release of his his firewall product, which I don't have installed. But um, like, if I had to install one, I would totally use his because he's a. I mean, he he speaks at Black Hat, right? Uh, the guy the guy's a smart dude, so. <laughs> Oh, we also had some great questions. I just also want to say hello to our audience. I know we've been talking pretty much nonstop, but we have a lot to talk about today. But uh, yeah, I see we have some great questions from 
uh, Mike uh, Bookby uh, in the chat. And then we also have some questions from uh, our Preet. Um, I think you answered one of them. But uh, Mike was yeah. asking, um, what's something I can clearly point to to convince my boss uh, that if we start putting our apps in containers, we'll have a more secure environment? Well, I mean, everything we just said for one. Um, great question, Mike Bookby. Um, uh, Britt, do you have anything to add to that? Um, sorry, I was answering uh, uh, Rolimbo in chat about coronavirus. Like, <laughs> I couldn't pass up that, that comment. So what make was the question again? Oh, sorry. Make sure to run your coronavirus in a container separate from the rest of your host. Mm -hmm. That's very important. You might have messed that right. up. Um, but as to the other question, um, it was uh, what one thing could you probably tell your boss uh, to convince them that running oh. your apps in containers is something that would make your, uh, your entire business much safer? So I don't think that, I, so I have a bunch of one things. <laughs> I don't think that one thing is the same for everyone. So what I tend to do, like this is how kind of like as a consultant, whenever I want to show my value, right? And say like, look, look at the good thing I did. I always ask them, and, and you will know this if you work at a company, what's the thing that sucks the most right now, right? Is it, <laughs> is it, is it your, your servers are really out, you know, out of date and not patched? Is it your deployment t timeline between someone committing code and actually getting on the server? Is that like really long months, weeks? I mean, whatever that is. Um, is it security auditing? Do you don't have a, a really easy way to scan for software vulnerabilities in your apps and their dependencies? Like you find that thing and then I'll give you a one liner. Like there's a one line command that you can use that will scan and tell you all the vulnerabilities, well, CVE vulnerab known vulnerabilities. Um, oh, that's in your application dependencies, if it's in a container, rather than scanning the whole host, which might show up lots of vulnerabilities that have nothing to do with your app and are use, you know, it's about tools that would never be used by your app and are never related to your app. Whereas you can use tools like Trivi. There's a dozen uh, tools out there, open source and uh, paid. In fact, now Docker in their latest release now has Docker scan as a command line out of the box. <laughs> it uses a company called Sneak, S N. YK, I think is how you pronounce it, um, or it's, it's spell it rather. <laughs> Snipe. Um, uh, yeah, so I'll throw that one in chat because Sneak is um, a popular one, but Trivi is my favorite open source one. Um, and Trivi does really good at basically you just tell it the image name and it will tell you all the vulnerabilities and it spits out a nice CLI report. Um, Sneak is a company that has a bunch of products around it, um, but they're, they're focused on uh, scanning um, there's tons of other ones out there, you know, um, Veronis might even do it. I don't know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but there's uh, lots of scanners out there. And I think um, that's a common question. And I, I would say that like any security scanning tool for, for vulnerabilities, always use more than one because it's an opinion. I mean, as much as we all like to think that these are facts, there are opinions in the risk of vulnerabilities and what you and how that vulnerability affects you. Hmm. So, uh, I always tend to run two, maybe a closed source paid one and then an open source one and try to compare the results if, if I was working with the security team. But that's just one, right? Like deployment, uh, Docker greatly speeds up the ability for you to deploy and even roll back software. It's very reliable that way where you can reproduce the results over and over and over again. And then if it doesn't go well, you can just as easily roll back to a previous version as you did rolling forward. And that's something that you don't really get out of the box with most package managers and deployment methodologies. Um, I could just go on and on, but there's there's some of those heavy hitters around reproducibility. So works on my machine is no longer the issue. You don't have to say, well, it worked on the developer's machine. I don't know why it doesn't work on the server, because now you can package and test exactly what the developer was doing um, and then run that exact same thing on the server. Uh, there are things where Docker and with other tools on top of it, like Swarm or Kubernetes, can do these really easy things called health checks just to make sure that your app is running properly. And if it doesn't, it will it will basically completely take get rid of it and recreate it all mm -hmm. over again and and spin it back up in a much more um, I would say rather than just trying to keep your misbehaving app re restarting, it, it's a, a little bit uh, more reliable way to say, hey, look, this app's not functioning correctly. There's maybe something wrong with the way that it's working. We're just going to throw it away and start over again. And um, that's, a, that's a common approach when you're in production that way. But there's so many different things that I see with companies. They use their infrastructure a much, uh, they get a better utilization out of their existing infrastructure. So if you have a data center and you're probably only getting 
15 to 25 percent CPU utilization because you have a bunch of VMs. Usually when companies, well, every case that I've seen that people deploy containers instead of VMs, so they, so they reduce their VM count. Doesn't mean you don't use VMs, it just means you use less of them. And now you have this other thing inside them that's, that's a container that isolates your programs. Instead of having the VM as that dedicated isolation layer for every stinking app, mm -hmm. now you can have a larger VM that maybe runs 20 apps in 20 different containers. And so now you have less OSs to patch and update you have less, if you're on Windows or some other, you know, Red Hat, you don't. You have less licensing you have to pay for. And you now get this idea of each one of these applications can be updated separately from the others. So if you have three apps that all run Python and one you need, you know, you need to patch Python, you can do it per app, not per host, which is a, a riskier proposition. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a ton of stuff there that um, I would say, you tell me the pain point and I'll probably tell you how Docker could improve that. <laughs> So, okay, I'm curious from the perspective of maybe one of our audience that wants to run a program that has been packaged with Docker. Like, how easy is that? Like, what do they need to do? And is it is it really that hard to get started using containers, like, for someone who's never done it before? Like, do they need to sit back and watch, like, a 20-minute video about, like, the concepts of Docker and stuff? Or can they just, like, you know, try it out? Hopefully it works. If not, then try to configure some stuff. Like, how difficult it is for a total beginner to uh, right. just install an app with Docker? Yeah, so you that's a great question. So Docker is known for a um, an easy to use command line. That's one of its um, uh, core principles is that the command line is opinionated, which means that it sets a bunch of things by default that it thinks you want. And then as you advance in your knowledge, you can change all those options that are defaults rather than, you know, for example, I was doing a curl earlier today and I can never remember all the curl options. Um, <laughs> And I, I wanted it to be I wanted it to be insecure, and I wanted it to use a custom host header, and, and then something else. Um, and I could I always have to just Google those things because I could never remove, remember all the options. But with Docker, you tend to be able to use at at the beginning of your journey the defaults out of the box, so the commands are very short. Like if you want to run an Apache HTTP daemon, that's what that's the HTTPD is the the actual binary. So you could do a Docker run HTTPD, and that single command would go look on the internet on something called Docker Hub to see if that exists. If it exists, download it and then run it. And that and you did all that in, you know, three words essentially. So, it's really great to start out. Now, as you start to want to customize that, you start to have to learn some options to that command line and then as you want to make your own Docker container images, and that image part is where you need to make your custom program. So, if you have your own, you know, Node.js utility or web app or something, and you want to package that up, then that's where you're going to have to learn about Docker files. And Docker files are the recipe. They're kind of like a shell script. They're a little bit like shell scripting, but the Docker file is that, that script that Docker will take and apply it. Essentially, it's running all the different commands in that to make this image, which is the tarball you ship around between all your computers. And so I'd say that once you run a couple of commands, and this is kind of how my Docker mastery course goes through it, is we, we get you used to a couple of the easy commands just to run stuff and have some fun. And you, you run a MySQL server by just typing Docker run MySQL. Um, you might run a, an, an Nginx proxy by typing Docker run Nginx. Um, if you want to expose that on your machine so you can see it from your browser, you could just add a little option there that's a dash P for ports, or actually technically it's for published publish command, you can do a dash P 80 colon 80. And that's, that's a way to say, hey, take port 80 on my local machine, my Mac or my Windows or my Linux machine, and any traffic that goes to port 80, send it into that container where the app is at. Because by default, it's another great thing about Docker is that not only is it controlling that application and what it can see to the host, but it's limiting, limiting what can get into that container from the outside as well. So on the network, it's by default, running NAT, it's running that network address translation so that that container is not running on the real IP of your host on the real network, like you know applications tend to do by default. And only the ports that you tell it at runtime, what you want to forward to it, will it do. So it's kind of like you controlling the IP tables on, on your Linux machine from a single easy to use command, because that's what the Docker is doing in the background. Because again, Docker's Docker is really just automation around the Linux configuration. So it's controlling the IPs and the, the routing of packets and the firewall through IP tables. 
It's controlling how the application can, you know, is limited in terms of its of the resources it can use, like how many, how many CPUs, how much memory. It's using the Linux kernel to do that. And it's also limiting where that application can see on the host and whether it can do things like act as root. It's doing all that through Linux kernel capabilities. So it's not really inventing new ideas. It's just taking previously hard Linux kernel concepts that was for you know ninjas and mm -hmm. making a, a, it easy for the, the everyday person to use. So we had a really good question um, and also a comment from Vishal. J the, yeah. He just says that Docker helps him a lot. Uh, he doesn't have to set up bin or repository, nothing. Uh, but the question was yeah. from the real Zam, who's a regular on our uh, show. So thanks for the question. Hello. Uh, which is, uh, can you explain how resources are shared on a system running multiple packages or containers or apps like this? Yeah, so if we're talking just about containers, um, by default, when Docker runs an application, if let's say you're root on a Linux system. When you run something in a container, you're already root, right? So the container is isolated. So let's say you're running uh, an Apache web server in there. So that Apache web server is limited to what it can do and what it can see. But its resource usage is, is just like a regular application. So by default, unless you add extra options when you do the Docker run commands, that container can, is acting in terms of resources like every other app on your system. If it needs to take all 8 gig of memory and all four CPUs, it can do that. It's totally fine. But you can change that Docker run command to limit it. And that uses something called C groups. And C groups is if you just go Google C G R O U P S, right? Um, that technology and, and Linux kernels allows any application, not just Docker, but allows you to control the resource access of any application in Linux. And so for decades, we've really used that, that technology through various command line tools to limit you know, your Java app from eating all the memory on a host, right? So Docker is just doing that in the background, but it doesn't do it by default. So out of the box, it's just assuming that your app, because it doesn't know that your you know, Apache web server might only need 200 mega RAM. Right, so uh, it's not going to limit you in that way, but you can totally do that. And and Docker has this terminology for that. They actually call it the way they approach this and how it's easy out of the box, but then you can customize everything later. They call it batteries included but swappable, <laughs> which in, implies that it's everything works out of the box. But if you need to swap out for your own custom batteries, right, you can you can do that later. And so if you do a Docker run dash dash help, that's uh, like any good command line tool it gives you, I think it's like 75 options. And they go into, you know, giving it advanced Linux permissions in the kernel, you know, even applying certain things like SE Linux or App Armor or SecComp, if you're into the whole security realm of Linux, it'll apply those things custom if you want as well. Um, it will allow you to bind mount different paths on the host so that if you want, you know, slash var, you know, slash, some location slash DB, if you want that location on the host to be seen by the container, you can do that in the command line options. So mostly when people start out, they're just getting this, they're getting their head around it, right? It's like, I don't even understand what Docker is doing. But once they start to understand that, oh, it's just really automating some of the core underlying Linux technologies that we've all enjoyed for the last couple of decades. And it, for a lot of us, it was teaching us that these things already existed. We just didn't know they were there because we, Previously, it was really advanced commands that were long and complex that we didn't quite understand how to use. Mm, so we've got, I think, a good question um, <clears throat> from Chaos, another regular on our show. Uh, so thank you for the question. Uh, so is a container app like a portable app? Explain it like I'm five, please. And yes. Smiley emoji. And if I were to take a crack at it, just not knowing much about it, yeah, so I'm still a beginner, it. explaining it to a fellow beginner. It's basically like you're taking an app and you're taking all the requirements around with it. You're virtualizing it, but you're leaving out all the stuff that makes a virtual machine really big and heavy and only taking the essentials so that you're basically taking that developer's environment, all the stuff that they needed in order to make that app, packaging it together in a nice little container and then running it independently without having it actually installed on your operating system. So when it's time for it to go, you can just get rid of it. And while you're using it, it has everything it needs without needing to go through that annoying process of installing tons of dependencies. How'd I do? That sounds great. <laughs> although, although a five-year-old might not know what dependencies are, but this is true. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, it's hard, right? Explain like I'm five. I would say uh, if you were really five, I would say you know, like that game you put on your phone that your parents allow you to, you know, you, we give you the permission to download it, and then 
we're uh, then you play it and then we we delete it and then you can't see it anymore. That's what a container is. Like yes, it the the image is the app on the internet, and then when you're downloading something from an app store, that's just like doing a pull, a Docker pull command to pull that down to the local machine. And then if your parents are the root on the machine, then they're able to, you know, control the app. Uh, delete the app completely, re redownload a new version of the app. They're basically acting like you know the admin on your phone. If you're if you've ever had to be a parent and have um, you know the parental uh, controls on the on your phones for your kids, it's very much like that. It, it's the server version of that concept of isolating the application and everything that it needs to run, and then being able to move it around and install it on a bunch of machines all at the same time. Yeah, how'd so I do? I who was that? I, Who was that a question from? Uh, I think KS. that was from KS, and I think that that was a really, really good description that anybody who's ever downloaded an app can understand. Because really, like compared to the the old school version of just going on GitHub, doing like a get pull, and then setting it up with other like a requirements.txt file, it, it seems like it's a much more of a just you know you download the thing and you run it uh, kind of approach rather than you have to update your host system in order to match the requirements of this thing you want to run. Right. Right, which is why you know, you know, if I have to run uh, as a con as a consultant, I you know, every project I'm on has different requirements, right? So this this company is using, um, you know, Node.js 10. This other company is using Node.js 12. And we, if you're a developer, you know, whatever frameworks and language you're writing in, you usually end up with some sort of command line that has to manually control from the host level the binary that you're running, the Ruby version or the Node version or the Python version, and you have to do all these ENV things and, and extra command line tools. Well, Docker solves all of that as well. So if I need to run at the same time even three different apps with Node, on one on 8, one on 10, one on 12, I can easily do that through you know that, that recipe, right? the Docker file that builds your recipe for the, the tarball, the image. Um, that recipe would just specify which versions of nodes it needs. And then once I've packaged those up in the three different versions, uh, those, di those different container images are essentially different versions. And you'll find that, in fact, if you go to Docker Hub, that's where, that's one of the large, that's the biggest place, I'd, I'd say, um, hub.docker.com. It's kind of like the NPM of Docker. Mm -hmm. And so you can go there and see all, you know, there's mil millions and millions of images that you can look through there's about 180 official images. So these tend to be things like, you know, Java, Python, uh, you know, any language, Node.js, Ruby, they, they all have official images. Um, and, and then there's applications like MySQL, Postgres, uh, WordPress, right? Uh, Kali Linux, like these are all things that you can probably just type Docker run um, WordPress mm -hmm. and it will, you'll know that that's the official image and that it's maintained either by the Docker team or the official WordPress team, and it's you know there's companies behind it trying to keep it correct and secure. Um, that it's only the one word. So one of the things that people first learn when they're using Docker is kind of like GitHub repos. You know how like on GitHub I have like my username and then slash the repo name, mm -hmm. and uh, in Docker you also have that concept. So when you do a Docker run, if it was me and I had my own custom image running. MySQL, I might do docker run brett slash MySQL. And then that's my username. Actually, my, my username is Brett Fisher. So it'd be Brett Fisher slash whatever the name is of my app. And then that would pull down my own custom image rather than the official image of MySQL, which would just be called docker run MySQL. So that's one of the first things that people need to learn too, is that like GitHub that stores your source code, Docker Hub stores your binaries. This is you know, when you think of Docker images, think of them as an artifact. If you're into software development, they're an artifact of your source code. So usually you have your source code on GitHub, and Docker Hub doesn't replace GitHub or any other source code, right? It's not a source code repository. It's meant to be as an output of that. So in the past, you might have created an RPM if you're into you know making packages for Linux. You might make a Debian package or a Yum package, or nowadays we might make you know, a Ruby package or an NPM package or some, you know, some sort of package distribution system. Well, Docker is now that new package distribution system. So Docker Hub being the default, but you can use, there's, you know, GitHub now has their, their own, uh, Microsoft has their own, Google has their own, everyone has their own package repository, but Docker Hub tends to be like the default, right? Mm. So 
you go to Docker Hub and you can go through this list of like the 170 or 80 open source projects usually. Um, I mean, Windows is technically on there. You can technically run Windows in a container. So <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's not really Windows. It's more like you could run the .NET framework in a container more, I should say more accurately. And so that's, so technically even the, some of those proprietary apps are still official releases on Docker Hub. So if you're on a Windows machine, you could technically pull down a .NET framework or now the new .NET Core, and you could run those in an isolated container on a Windows machine or Windows server or something like that. Um, so yeah, you've got, you, and you, and just, this all applies to every major architecture now. So it applies to Raspberry Pis that run Docker. You can do it on a lot of IoT things. You can do mm -hmm. it on a mainframe even nowadays. Uh, you can do it on ARM and you know 64-bit, 32-bit, you name it. There's probably a Docker build uh, for that. And you, when you go to Docker Hub, you can also see for those applications like Python, you can see that it'll list all the different architecture types and OS types that it supports, you know, including things like Windows and Linux and 64 versus 32 and ARM versus Intel. So. So for like a total beginner, um, you mentioned uh, Kali Linux. Like this is different than running Kali Linux as a virtual machine because you would basically be able to run an application that runs in Kali Linux or was built for Kali Linux or that someone's released for Kali Linux in a container without having to have Kali Linux fully installed. Is that the way it would work? That's right. That's right. In fact, that's my prefer. I'm not an expert necessarily on that particular distribution, but I have run it and my... I ran it before containers, right? Back when it was like, I would boot an ISO, I would download the ISO, put it in a VM, boot up the VM, like you would a traditional, you know, Linux situation. Situation, But now you, I would always put it in a container. I probably would never do it in a VM. Now technically in the background, just to be clear for some of you that are thinking, well, how does this work on Mac if it's a Linux container? You're, you're already ahead of me on that. The way that it works on Windows and Mac, because this isn't a VM, right? So a container can't emulate a kernel. So if you build an application for Linux, let's say, you can't just run that on a Windows kernel, right? That's kind of breaking the laws of how kernels work. So um, if you're on Mac and uh, Windows, they have their own kernels. So the way this all works for most of us is we run something called Docker Desktop. Docker Desktop is a GUI download. It includes all the command line tools, but it's basically a big d download for your, your particular OS, if you're not Linux. And it will then run in the background a tiny little Linux VM. Hmm. And then it, it does up some fancy things with networking and whatnot to make it seem like when I do a Docker run Kali Linux or a Docker run Ubuntu or something, when I'm doing that on my Mac, and I spin it up, and then I, you know, I can even bring it up in a browser, if, depending on the application, or I can shell into it, however, you know, whatever the application is. Um, but what's really happening in the background is Docker, on, on my behalf, is spinning up a tiny little VM that's probably, I don't know, 5, 10 meg in size. It's really small. And it's running that Linux-compatible binary in that Linux VM, but making it transparent to me as a Mac user that hmm. it's really doing that. So that's it's not super cool. Yeah. No, I, I because love otherwise, because, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. I, I'm really interested. Yeah, because otherwise, right, we'd have to have Mac built binaries of all these Docker containers. And there is technically no such thing as a uh, yet, because uh, Apple hasn't you know, allowed or, a, 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 you know, they, Mac hasn't created their own container specification for their kernel. So Microsoft did that. Microsoft went out and said, we love Docker. We're going to actually invent something called Windows containers that are going to work just like Linux containers, and they will run your Windows EXE binaries in the same kind of enclave, just like Linux does for Linux containers. But for Mac, we don't really have that. Apple hasn't come out and said, oh, yeah, we're going to provide uh, to Docker or to any container tool, we're going to provide the APIs so that you can run a Docker binary. I'm sorry. Yeah, you can run a, a Mac-built binary inside a container. Technically, if you're, if you're into Mac security, Macs already kind of do that. Macs already have this app notation, that's idea of an abstraction of apps where you can just like delete the app and it has everything inside of a bundled system. Um, and it has its own security parameters that said that do a lot of the same ideas, but they don't call it a container and they don't use the standard container ecosystem tooling. So for Macs, we're kind of left with the only option is either build your own VM and run Linux or run Docker Desktop, which provides all this out of the box uh, experience for you. Um, and it's a free app. You can download it for free from Docker. So, 
That I, I think for total beginners, especially for people that are into security, that are looking for reason, a reason to explore Docker, as a consumer of software or someone who's trying out new security tools, maybe you don't have the best computer. Maybe you have a weird computer that nobody else in the in the GitHub comments has like had the same problem with. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why it might be confusing to try to run something. Uh, and we always give the advice of, oh, well, maybe you should do a bare metal install of Kali Linux if you want a lot of stability. Or, oh, maybe you should run a virtual machine to make sure that, you know, everything's up to date. But if you have the option of just running a tiny little Linux kernel and then running the, the one app, the one app you actually want to try. A lot of the time, the reason you're yep. installing Kali Linux is because you want to do one thing. So the fact that you can do that in a container and you can use minimal system resources, you're not spinning up a whole VM, which might have a bunch of other stuff misconfigured or whatever else. You know, it takes less system resources that you might not have uh, to do something that could be just very simple in order to run a single piece of software. So I love that because I find myself running virtual machines to run a single program just because it's built for Kali Linux. And the other thing I see is we often recommend people use Ubuntu as their first operating system when they're getting into hacking and infosec. So they get familiar with Linux and they can use it yeah. as a daily driver. I, I kind of liken Kali Linux to like driving an armored personnel carrier to the grocery store when you try to use it as a, a daily driver. It's like not necessary. There's weapons all over it that you're not going to need to send an email right. or do like you know graphic design stuff. So if you can run an app that's meant for Kali Linux in Ubuntu and be able to, you know, there's not that much change there. We have a Linux kernel running already. Like it just see, it means that you don't have to go through the nightmare of trying to download, install, and configure something that's meant for a different operating system uh, on something that's a much better system for your being a daily driver and learning about Linux and, and even developing software. Yeah, I mean, that's true for a lot of utilities. Um, for example, I, I'm a Vim person, love Vim. Uh, don't necessarily consider myself a, a Vim expert, but I've been using Vim daily for at least a decade. Um, and I, I use a, I guess you could call it a distribution of Vim called Space Vim. And I talk about it a lot on my show, and it's like uh, Space Vim is great because if you, if you just want to get productive, it's, it's kind of like the VS code of Vim where it just comes out of the box with a bunch of utilities and it's kept up to date and pretty regular. But just getting Vim installed, then Space Vim installed, and then configuring it all to customize and all that can be quite, you know, even for the beginner, quite challenging. So they have their own container. So I can now do a Docker run, I think it's like Space Vim slash Space Vim. And I can even add in there a little option. So you can do this thing where we talked about earlier, a volume bind mount where you you map a host path into the container. And that basically is giving the container permissions to see any files and folders at the location mm. you give it, right? With so it's kind of giving With your fancy Vim settings all in that folder? Yeah, exactly. So nice. I can I can kind of put that in there as a new mount. And so then I'm basically spinning up whatever the latest space Vim is without needing, you know, because I tell you, my Vim, I mean, I try to keep my Mac pretty clean, but, you know, Something is always breaking, <laughs> you know. <laughs> space Vim is uh, Space Vim add-on is breaking somehow. That Git repo that was a, a extra module got uh, changed and it wasn't committed. So then I can't do a Git pull anymore because there's changes in the branch and like it, it's there's something always happening. And I'm like, I just want I just want my Vim to work. I just want an editor that will always start when I start it. And so the, the way I can do that is just do Docker run Space Vim slash Space Vim, uh, and then I get an editor. So yeah. I know a Vim person who's going to freak out when they learn about that because their custom <laughs> their custom Vim file like travels with them to like every yeah. system they use because they just love it like it's it's how they develop stuff and it's very like personalized. So if you're a Vim person, then that's great news. Yeah, we have a and, bunch of and, good questions too. Oh yeah, and I was going to say so yeah do yeah you can do your own right. It's really once you learn how to make a container, you can put that custom configuration as long as it's you can make private container images. So Docker Hub is just like uh, GitHub in the terms that. You use push and pull to get stuff to and from it. You can have public or private repos, so you can you can put a uh, make a Git repo for your. Let, let's say he has a special Vim solution. He doesn't really want, you know, maybe he doesn't have any secrets in it because that's probably a bad idea. But maybe he just has some stuff he doesn't want to put out there in public. So he can. Uh, I think on Docker Hub you get one repo for free, and he can upload his image with his preferred Vim installation, like the whole thing, the preferred Vim plus his extra settings. And then just keep that. And then imagine any machine he's on, as long whether it's Windows, Mac, or Linux, as long or it could be his Raspberry Pi in his living room, whatever. As long as he has Docker running on the, in that thing, he can just do a Docker run, you know, username slash vim, vim, and it will download the latest version of it 
and run it and then automatically you, you can add a couple little things and you can add something called dash it which will give me an interactive terminal right inside the thing so it, it basically gives me a bash shell inside there where i can start up vim and it, even then if you think about it the container can't see any applications outside of it which means if you want a shell in the container you have to have a shell in the container so you have to take your application typically will have a bunch of things in it, including bash, which will be in that container so that when you shell in it, it can execute the bash shell inside it. Some people get into this whole world of very tiny little minimal of images, and you can even get it to where the only thing in your container image is uh, a C binary or a Golang <laughs> binary or something that can you know build a static binary where it's a single file. Um, but if you do that, you, you can't even shell into it because there's no shell to run. So that's how crazy these things can get. They can get super tiny and super secure where if someone were to somehow hack into your web app, they couldn't even get a shell to do nefarious stuff remotely because there isn't one in it. You know, they could hide, <laughs> <laughs> they, they could just hide everything and remove it all so that the only thing in there is their app and nothing else. That's really, really cool. Um, and I think that if we were going to make a commercial for like beginner hackers and why they should learn to use Docker, that would be it. Like the ability to like have an app that runs the same way on any computer you have access to, like good luck getting that to work by pretty much right. any other means aside from just complete virtualization or installing like a new directory or, or booting off a hard drive or, or a, a USB right. thumb drive or something. Okay, before we get to the questions, I was going to just end this, end this topic and say, if you told me that I had to uh, I was going to go uh, to DEF CON or something, and I was going to, or Black Hat or something, and uh, I was going to have to um, provide an application or provide an experience that someone that I will take someone else's application, and it's going to be beat on the entire week, right, or something like that. I'm just going to put it on the internet, but make it a honeypot, whatever. Um, basically... I would build a, a Linux system. I would the only thing I would put on is Docker. I would I would update all the patches and everything. I might even use like a minimal Linux version, like Alpine. Like Alpine distributions are really tiny, uh, security focused Linux distribution. So I would do that, and then I would install Docker on it. And Docker is the only thing I'm going to install on the host, right? Presuming that I can't put like security tools and monitoring logging tools on there. But let's just say I can't do that. So I install Docker. And then I would enable um, some th things that I would turn on in Docker to even harden it more. And I actually have a whole list of that that we can put in the chat. I'm, I'm actually going to paste it here in the chat Please. Um, in YouTube. So I had this whole list of things that you should do in order. Um, and I call it uh, my security first list. And it gets pretty long. There's maybe 15 things on it now. But you go top down because it's all about the bang for the buck with security hardening, right? So if I'm going to do things, I want the first things I do to be relatively easy to implement and relatively big bang for my buck. I don't want to implement something that's going to be that's going to make my system really hard to do uh, to use. At the same time, it would maybe make it it wouldn't really provide much benefit in terms of security. I want real, like production grade, not not imaginary security that we theorize in the, in the realms of research, but more like practical security that's really going to protect you. So I would maybe implement the first ten of those things. And then if you gave me your app and you said, hey, I got this Python app, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to hack against it remotely and I might be able to get into it because I, there might be a vulnerability in my code. So I'm going to put that in a container. There's a setting you can do in every container you run that makes it run as a normal user, not just on the host, which is a separate thing called user namespaces, but inside the container itself, it will actually emulate a regular user, not the root user in the container. So even in that thing, there won't be, even if they were to break out of the app, they can't be root in the container, much less never get to the host. And then I would use something called a distroless image, which is in that list. And a distroless image means that I don't have the standard tools that every hacker expects once they get on your host. So if they were able to, let's say, you know, get your SQL query to somehow run an executable on the SQL host, they would expect to have things like an apt or a yum or NPM or some sort of package distribution tool or a curl or wget or even a shell. But you can remove all that stuff from your app using something called distroless images that take out all the, you know, everything that's optional, it completely strips it out of your app in the container. So now if that Python image is there, the only thing they could do at their worst is to run Python binaries as a standard user in the container. And it wouldn't, they wouldn't be on the real host IP address. They wouldn't be on the real host file system. They, you know, they, they basically have nothing. <laughs> they can't, e you know, they can't even download a binary because I can set it in Docker to every single file is read only so that 
they can't write to the file system. And they're not given permissions by default with Docker to do things like create a temp FS in memory. They can't do that either. I mean, there's just, there's a crazy amount of stuff that you could make with just a few, maybe a couple of few hours of setting up Docker. And, you know, I, I, I feel like it would win over any standard install on a regular host system any day of the week in terms of like a, a hacking contest or something. So I'm not throwing down that gauntlet or anything, but I'm just saying <laughs> if I had to, if I had to do something and I knew it was going to be uh, attacked constantly, I would totally set that up um, that way. Yeah, anyway, I, let's get some questions. Well, yeah, I was also going to say for people that are thinking about running something like a honeypot that requires a bunch of configuration options and could also be kind of risky to run like on your own system, it sounds like this might be something that would be a much, much, much better alternative than trying to run some sort of honeypot like on your own system. So, <laughs> right. If you don't I would run a honey. If, if I was on a cloud host and I didn't have to worry about bandwidth, right? Uh, uh, I would run a honeypot in Docker. No, pro I wouldn't really worry, worry about it. I mean, like if I had to, because it's so isolated. And as long as you're keeping updated on your kernel versions and your 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 host OS packages and like you know things like SSH, if you leave you shouldn't leave that open on the default port on the internet. But if you did, uh, you know I trust SSH. But it, you know you still need to patch all that stuff. But that's really all I would worry about. Once you have Docker on there, yeah, it's it's about what's in the container, not so much about what's in the host. Smart. I like that. Cool. All right. Question time. There's been a bunch of good ones. So um, let's see. I'm, I've am i answered uh, Rolimbo, who's made a, a resurgence, as it were, in the comments. But um, right. one of them is uh, Docker can be a resource hogger and requires a lot of privileged access. Any tips on keeping it lean and still secure? Yes. So, uh, well, there's a couple of things. So uh, it's all relative, right? So if you're, uh, let's talk about two different things. Let's talk about not running it as root. So. In Linux, out of the gate with Docker, Docker wants to do several things when you do a Docker run command. It wants to download software to the hard drive in, in the form of this image and store it in a cache. It wants to be able to use C groups and namespaces to put resource and, and access limitations around your application. And then it also wants to give it a, a fake IP address natted behind your firewall, your, your, your host IP, using essentially IP tables as the firewall, right? Now, that last piece on Linux today that I'm aware of requires root access. Any program that wants to do that requires root. So that's one of the reasons still today that Docker by default runs as root. Now, that doesn't mean your containers run as root. It just means that the Docker binary that's managing it all runs as root because it needs to be able to create on the fly these privileged concepts that require root access. Now, there's a couple of things you can do. Um, you can go, I'm going to put this URL in there as well. You can go to git.docker.com sl slash rootless. Now, git.docker.com is a shell script that you can download and install Docker with. It's a really convenient way. But if you want to do it rootless, you can go to git.docker.com slash rootless, and it will give you a shell script that will install Docker as a, basically as a system D service as a regular user. So if you're logged in as the Ubuntu user on Ubuntu, it will make it a user service, essentially, and then you can use it there. Now, this is pretty common in CI environments. That's uh, for continuous integration and testing. So, so developers that are doing that kind of thing, they might use rootless because they don't want all of their CI tools to spin up Docker and use, and use it as a root on the host. The negative of this is that you now prevent yourself from doing any custom networking. So you can do some of it. it the devil's in the details, essentially. Uh, try it, see if you can get that to work. Now, in that case, you're still running Docker, mm -hmm. right? So the other question that he had, uh, Rombolio, um, they, they, um, what was it? I'm already forgetting. Oh, it was about uh, the bloat. So one of the things that Docker does is it bundles in a whole bunch of stuff. And it, it, it provides things like import and export. It provides, uh, you can snapshot. Now it even does, you know, security scanning and just, it has a ton of stuff. It, it does something called Swarm, which is, kind of like Kubernetes and essentially those tools allow you to take many different hosts and connect them all together to act like one giant Docker system. Um, so it has that built in. So it's known for taking up, uh, it's a, it's a I'm, not, I'm not sure the size of the binary. I can't, I can't remember actually how big the install is. It's not terrible. It's, I don't know, 100 meg or something. Um, uh, and it's, but it's, but it's going to use more than 5 meg of RAM to get started. And Docker itself is just a tool writing on other tools. So underneath it, it runs something called Container D. And container D is kind of like the background engine that talks to the Linux kernel on Docker's behalf. Now, 
most of you will never need to worry about this uh, unless you start to get into hacking and this kind of answers uh, Rolimbio, Rolimbo's question. Um, that And underneath that, something else is called run C. And run C's job is really essentially to just start the container and then shut it down. Like run it, start it, keep it running, shut it down when it's done. So there's already three binaries between you running the command and then your app actually running. Hmm. Now, there are other ways to do this. If you've ever heard of something... By the way, Docker is not the only way to run a container. It just happened to be the first and the most popular. Uh, you can run that container D program without Docker. It doesn't have as many features. Uh, it's it's spelled container with a D on the end. That's actually how it's pronounced. Um, and, yeah, and you can <laughs> you can run that without Docker. Now it's not as user friendly. It's not as uh, easy out of the box. Doesn't have as many features. But it's going to remove away. It runs its own daemon. It's still a daemon-based service. But it's a lot of times when you're running Kubernetes, which is that multi-server Docker thing I was talking about. When you run that in the cloud, they're running Container D underneath because they don't really need all the features that Docker runs. The other one that is uh, has become pretty popular for just uh, this is just for local use. It's not something that I would necessarily say you should run a bunch of, across a bunch of production servers. But if you're just looking for local simple usage. Um, it's something from Red Hat. Uh, let me see if I can pull up the URL there. So Red Hat has been making a bunch of their own tooling separate from Docker to sort of break down what you might consider Docker the monolith, right? It's just a big thing. It's one program. It's meant to be really easy to use. It has a, a big CLI. And, oh, should uh, we uh, switch over to your screen? Oh, I'm, I'm, well, I, I, I'm going to. I'm just I'm searching right now for the oh, all the things yet. I want okay. to talk about. Sorry. All right, got it. Not That's yet. okay. <laughs> um, but thank you. Yeah. Ooh, there's also a great question from Zam that I cannot um, I cannot wait to hear the answer to. So yeah. maybe if you know it off the top of your head, um, the next question was. If there's any deliberately vulnerable apps you know on Docker, mm, that's a good question. All right, we'll cue that one. All right, so uh, I'm looking. Okay, let me um, let me throw up my other window. We'll go to my web browser. So there's a couple of tools out there from Red Hat, um, and so when you think of the way that Red Hat's approaching this, Red Hat approaches this, and that, this is what's great about open source is we can have different opinions uh, about how to do something. Right. So Docker's idea is. We're going to bundle it all. We're going to make it easy for you to use. They're primarily, I wouldn't say they're only developer focused because I mean, I'm technically an operator and I love it, but they're, they're, they're catering to the developer experience of ease to use out of the box. Now, Red Hat tends to come from the operator standpoint and they, they subscribe a little bit more hardcore to the, the, the traditional Unix idea of small programs, small functionality, you know, individual programs do their own thing, right? So they took Docker and they actually broke it out into three different tools. Uh, one of them is Podman. Now, what Podman does is it it uses the system D already on your Linux system as the way to spin up the container. Because again, these containers are really just using Linux kernel capabilities, mainly uh, C groups and namespaces. Those are the two main ones. And a little bit of IP tables thrown in and some other things. So it's using that stuff in the background. And so... Um, I'll throw in this URL. This is just a, a developer blog from, from Red Hat about how you, if you want to switch from Docker to use their tooling, this is how you might do it. And they have a bunch of stuff on it. Um, so in their case, Builda, uh, it's a, like the Boston way to say builder. Um, <laughs> Builda is the tool that you would make the Docker image with. And then Podman is the tool that you would run it with. But it, neither one of them is a daemon. They don't, they're not additional daemons on your system. So if you're looking at a really low memory utilization uh, way to do things, I would say use Podman. But again, Podman is only for using system D, and it's only for running containers. It, it doesn't have all the other functionality like making images or creating networking and like doing some of the advanced stuff. Uh, but it has some pretty neat stuff in it. And uh, if, you're, if you're into more of that... Uh, sysadmin-like utility kind of concepts of isolated little tools that do one thing only and do it well. Um, that's what how Red Hat's approaching it. Hmm. And the other well, okay, so what was the one on what was the one on deck? Uh, the, oh, okay, deliberately so this is, insecure. This is one I love because there's a lot of debate about how to do this. Like 
we will be teaching, you know, for example, like kids in high school, how to get into hacking. And a lot of the time we'll be asked like, why would you ever want to do that? Like what legitimate way would they ever have of using this skill? So one of the things we always try to do is find resources that are safe to use, safe to run. And some of these are like hardware based. When we teach about Wi-Fi hacking, you know, creating a, a network that you're allowed to attack is the only real way for us to be able to be like, hey, this is safe and responsible to teach people about hacking. So there's some deliberately vulnerable applications that you could run. Some of them are virtual machines. Some of them are, you know, other sort of in-between right. stuff. Um, there are some public websites to do this, but it seems like Docker would be kind of an ideal way of doing this because you're able to make sure that this vulnerable application isn't actually running on your system, where at the same time, you're able to ensure that it has the exact vulnerabilities uh, that you know are kind of expected. So when you right. walk through as your documentation should hold true no matter who is doing it. Right, that's a great point. And yes, um, I love it for that kind of stuff. And uh, you know, because I, I work with a lot of different companies and I'm always downloading their code to help them improve their Docker setup. And one of the one of the concerns that I always have is I'm running a but you know not only are we all downloading more more stuff from the internet more than ever, but I'm also running all these apps from all these companies and helping them with their apps and I, you know they're all over the place and like I I don't know what they do because I know nothing about their apps and um, I love because I always run them in Docker containers because I you know I can just do a Docker remove and delete every piece of evidence that that ever existed and know and know for certain that it's not accidentally running something in the background that I didn't know about, or it accidentally ran, spun up a MySQL server that I didn't know about or whatever. Like, um, I'm sure that none of those companies are nefarious, but um, you know, you never know. Um, maybe I'm not so sure. But uh, in this case, what I would say, the, I, the answer is I don't know, but also everything that can run on a Linux machine can run in a container. So a mm -hmm. container is just a way to isolate a standard Linux binary. Mm -hmm. So any, uh, whatever tools you know of that do that now, they probably already have a Docker way to run their tool. Like, you know, Kali came out and said, hey, we're going to put this in a Docker container because this is a way easier way to spin up your own little security toolkit that without having to, you know, sort of affect your host with all of these different downloads um, or, you know, run a whole separate VM for that. Uh, there's another, by the way, while we're talking about tools, this isn't for necessarily hacking tools, but look up, uh, let's see, net shoot. Um, I'm going to send you to the official one because I have a, a a fork of it, but the official one is better. I'll throw this in chat. Uh, Netshoot is essentially a it's a it's on this idea that just like vulnerable tools, like you could make a you could package a bunch of vulnerabilities into a container and put them on a system, um, but you could also do the opposite and say I'm going to pack a bunch of troubleshooting tools or you know or like Kali tools. Uh, so Kali would be that thing for security. Netshoot is that thing for troubleshooting. So imagine I'm on any system that has Docker running or any other container tool like Podman or Container D or whatever. I can just do a Docker run, um, uh, basically Nicolaka, uh, <laughs> which is Nicholas. Uh, he he maintains this uh, slash Netshoot, and he has a Docker container that you can show here. You know, you just run this Docker container real right here. And uh, I'm on my browser, actually. Can you switch to my browser? Yeah, can we switch to flat screen? Cool. And, um, you know, this can, so this is the repo in GitHub. And it's, a, it's not necessarily specialized custom tooling that he made. It's just a ton of Linux utilities all packaged into one container. Rather than you having to do apt get install like five different utilities, you mm -hmm. can just download this container and uh, this is like would be the example command, the one I've highlighted there. And then it has this list of everything, like one of my favorite tools for benchmarking or beating up a web server, not necessarily in a hacking sort of way, but just in a sort of a denial of service way, <laughs> uh, is Apache 2's bench, uh, um, Apache bench as it's called. You can, you know, you can install that on Linux usually t with something like that. That's one utility I always use to you know, load test my web, my web apps or whatever. But there's all these things that is in, are installed essentially um, as Linux utilities in this single container. So you can pull this one container down, run it on any system, and then when you're done, you, di you, didn't, you, don't, you didn't really permanently affect the system. You can just do a Docker remove in the name of this Netshoot, and it take, gets rid of it. So um, the same thing would be true for vulnerable apps. I just don't know of anyone who deliberately posts Oh, I've got vulnerabilities one. and links uh, images, but you could totally do that. Um, I don't see why not. So we have a user contributed one. Could we switch to my browser? 
Um, so uh, this was just contributed by somebody in the chat and it actually looks great. It's uh, down by the Docker and it is a deliberately vulnerable Docker VM that has misconfiguration. So there's two different settings. There's hard. Um, let me actually make this a little bit bigger. Uh, so there's hard. Uh, this requires you to combine your Docker skills as well as pen testing skills to achieve host compromise or the easier path knowing Docker would be enough to compromise the machine and gain root. Uh, but what's cool nice. is, you know, the the thought that there could be Docker misconfigurations, uh, there could be privilege escalation attacks that could happen, and that this is a way for people to start learning about them for free. Uh, thank you to, I believe it was uh, beep, boop, beep, or it might have been boop, beep, boop. I don't remember. But either way, thank you <laughs> for contributing this link, because it seems like a really good just example of a deliberately vulnerable application for you guys to poke around with. And guess what? You're not going to get in trouble. 100% not going to get arrested for compromising this and playing with it. So Yeah, I love uh, that idea. I love that idea. Yeah, especially if it's um, if it's a VM that has a misconfigured Docker, I would say that out of the box, I'm, I'm pretty trusting of Docker because it doesn't open up any TCP ports by default. Um, but if some, but but there is so a really great example of how what not to do with Docker yeah. is um, <laughs> that there there have been over the years, and if you go look up like Docker hacks or Docker security or Docker vulnerabilities, what you often find, unfortunately, is a little bit of media hype because you know everybody wants to report things. Um, not so much because I'm I'm a I'm a fan of Docker and I want to defend uh, you know the situation. But it's a lack of understanding in how Docker works. So the biggest vulnerability with Docker is not really a vulnerability, just a misconfiguration, that you enable the TCP port with no authentication. Now, let's remember back to earlier, Docker runs as root, which means if you give someone access to, to use Docker on a system, and you can do that, there's a Docker group that you can add people to on Linux, and it gives them permissions. You effectively have given them root when you do that, because they can run a Docker container, mount something, as root and then give themselves root access and they, they can sort of give themselves root eventually through that. So if you ever, if you have Docker access, unless you're running the rootless option, um, you're going to essentially have root privileges in one way or another. Hmm. So uh, Docker doesn't open itself up to remote TCP connectivity because one of the things that works uh, with all this container tooling is it's very common with Docker, Swarm, Kubernetes, all these tools, is there a client server model so when you run a Docker command on your local machine, you're actually running the client libra binary library, and that is talking to a socket running the Docker daemon. So Docker always comes as this two-part combo. Technically, the daemon is Docker D, and then when you just type Docker, that's the command line binary that's separate, and it's talking over this either a file socket or a TCP socket. Well, years ago, a lot of us, when we were remote, and we wanted to just type Docker on our local machine and control a remote server, we would have that TCP socket open. Now, Docker's documentation would always be very clear that this is not secured by default, it's using certificate encryption, and you need to go get yourself some, some TLS certificates and put them in to protect it for certificate authentication. Well, you know, it's the internet, which means people don't do that. And people would put their Docker hosts on the internet with a default port, I think it's 3389. Um, no, actually, that's not right. I can't, I can't remember the port, 17 something, I don't, I don't know. Um, the documentation show, tells you. Um, but that port, this is how long I haven't had to use the port, as I totally forgot about it. That port was, um, one, rarely locked down. So people would start realizing that if they just scanned for this port on the internet, they would essentially have root on the machine. It was like giving people SSH with no password. That's, that's essentially what you're doing. Um, so that was the vulnerability that really caused a bunch of, you know, there's a bunch of commotion in like 2017 about this. Um, so that was that, that was the first security vulnerability that people reported, and I, and I, if you read down on my security list, um, if you scroll up in the chat, my security list on GitHub, I'll put it again in there. Um, I actually have a little shortcut to it because I was security first, security first. Um, I have a little shortener, web shortener. Um, on that list, I actually comment a little bit about some of the stuff that's been happening in the news the last few years about misunderstanding of how containers work and thinking that somehow Docker is vulnerable out of the box or vulnerable by default. So that's the, the first misconception. The second one is you'll see tons of applications are insecure in Docker or people went to Docker Hub and scanned all the applications and said, there's all these insecure applications, they have vulnerabilities. Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. Their applications in Docker also have vulnerabilities just like they would if they were not in Docker. Like that right. doesn't, Docker doesn't make your application fix its lack of 
proper dependencies. <laughs> so, for example, if you go on GitHub and scan all the repos, um, and you find someone's code with bad Python dependencies that are old, and there's known CVB, CVEs for those dependencies, that will also be true in a Docker image. Those right. vulnerabilities will also be there in the app and the image, right? So security researchers will often go, and I think there's probably a really great one out there. It's like the top 50 insecure Docker in images or of you know, vulnerable hacking Docker images. Well, what they're doing is they're just scanning applications on Docker Hub, which is essentially like scanning GitHub, and mm -hmm. saying, look at all these ones that have vulnerabilities. Like they'll scan MySQL, and they'll say MySQL has vulnerabilities. Well, that's true because maybe last week there was a CVE that was related to MySQL and MySQL team hasn't updated yet. So every version of MySQL will be, will be vulnerable, including ones in containers. So that's a little bit of a misconception too, right? Is that people think that somehow, um, you know, Docker, putting something in Docker protects you on the host from the app, but the app itself, whatever vulnerabilities it has, it's still gonna make the app vulnerable. The, right. the nice thing is though, is if you run it in a container, they just won't be able to get out of the container to any of your other apps or to your host itself. So if I, like I tell people, if I'm gonna run a vulnerable app or you know some legacy application and I'm scared to run it, I'm always gonna run in a container because I'm isolating it and preventing it from infecting or uh, being able to attack anything else outside of itself. So Smart, so for hackers who are looking to run something like maybe a honeypot or something like you know a deliberately vulnerable application, this is probably the best way to do it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, Michael's got the, uh, in Shaft's got the next name of the course, what not to do with Docker. Yeah, so don't oh, yeah. open that don't open that TCP port. Um, in fact, <laughs> nowadays, I mean you can you technically can open it as long as you have TLS certificates on it, but most people don't go through that effort. Um, the cool new way now though, uh, is something where uh, I'm gonna show my terminal real quick. I just wanna show this little command line. And this is not necessarily new new. Let me go to my shell. It's maybe like three years old. Um, but still a lot of people don't know about it. So we've we talked about um, this Docker run command. I'm going to really zoom in. Docker run, you know, something like that command. And what that's saying is I want to run Nginx in a container. It's a, it's a web server and proxy system, Nginx, open source. And I want to, it's going to listen, Nginx itself is going to listen on port 80, but I want on my host, on my Mac for me, but if you're running on Linux and it would be on your Linux host, I want you to listen on the machine on port 8080 and tunnel that in to the container. So basically I'm doing port translation there as oh. an out of the box feature with Docker, right? So um, if I'm doing that, normally that's gonna do that, again, Docker is a client server model. So it's talking, I'm telling the command line to talk to my Docker server, which just happens to be my local machine. It could be something on the internet. It could be any server I have in my data center. Um, so if I did that, it would run it locally and open up port 8080 on my machine. But uh, and you can actually see that I had this little command line option that tells me my context. Hmm. So a lot of these container tools now have this idea of you running them against many different other machines. And so you can run it against remote machines, changing the context. And the context just meaning the point, the place I'm pointing to. So um, I have a little, I have a little thing. You can actually get this through my website. We can uh, talk about it later. But if you go to brettfisher.com slash shell, that actually will give you all of my shell utilities, including this mm. little kind of stuff that shows you command line stuff. Um, but in here, I can change that context to point to a remote machine, and it doesn't have to be TCP anymore. It can be over SSH. So I can do something as simple as saying Docker host as an environment variable, mm -hmm. and then tell it the SSH to whatever machine I have on the internet or locally. In my case, it's my Ubuntu server sitting in my closet. So I just call it Ubuntu. And then when I run that command, it's going to run this command against that host. And it does it over SSH. So as long as I have an SSH connection and or you know that I have a key for, I have an mm -hmm. SSH key, and I have and assuming I have permissions in SSH, it's going to automatically tunnel through SSH over whatever my SSH configuration tells me to, to run. It's going to use all those SSH config values that you might set in your SSH. And it's going to run that. So if I did a little quick test and I just did Docker version the regular way against Docker version with the the environment variable in there, then we might see, let's see if we can run a different build version. So this is the server running remotely on my Linux machine. Mm -hmm. So let's see, it's running 
nineteen three thirteen um, git commit d nine d, and then if I scroll down to my machine, it's uh, git. Oh, it's the same git commit. <laughs> um, wait, wait, it was a different build time. Seventeen uh, seventeen oh four um, versus ah, see, different build time. Hmm. That's how one of the things I have to do because they, they I keep my build so. Uh, Close, but Docker technically in their CI solution, when they build these binaries for Mac versus Windows or for Linux, uh, they're uh, so it's a different build time. So anyway, that kind of proved that when I change the change the environment variable, that changes my context, and that allows me to point my Docker command line to another machine without ever exposing an additional port other than SSH, assuming that you already have SSH opening Tricky. open on that machine. Oh, that's very neat. Right. Hmm. All right, so before we get into another question, I do have to say I think we're probably out of time. And most of the remaining questions either are from Rolem uh, Rolimbo or uh, <laughs> would require some time to answer. So well, maybe we well, should let's, do... let's, how about we how about we split the difference? Oh. I will my all of my answers will be twenty seconds or less. I'll do rapid fire. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um so we did have a question about the status of Docker compatibility. Now I gotta go up because this was from Zam. Oh sorry. Um no it's okay. Um curveball. Curveball. No, no. Uh da, 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 the question was what is the state of compatibility between Docker and Arch sixty four? Or A Arch sixty four. Um A R C H? A R A yeah. A A R Yeah, Arch Linux. Yeah. I think. Um, as, as far as I know, Arch Linux works fine. Oh, uh, I feel like there might have been a typo involved in there somewhere. Oh, okay. If, so, if I didn't get it right, uh, answer the question in a different way or, or ask it again, please. And yeah, the, um, I'll try to answer it later. But yeah, Arch, Arch Linux works fine. Yeah. Uh, that's what it was. And then the rest of the questions are just asking us to share the links. And except for Rolumbo asks, uh, specifically saying, don't answer any of my questions. They are very dumb. Ah, well, we hey, appreciate all questions, and especially everyone who's joined us in the chat today. There's no dumb question. Right? Yeah, and There's personally, no I have learned a ton about the different ways you can use Docker. I was aware that it was a really good way of distributing software, but I didn't really understand how many advantages it gives you when it comes to you know just being able to run something that you might be a little hesitant to run on your host computer and keep it isolated, keep it safe, and generally mitigate the risk of having an insecure app or something really spicy running on your computer that you might not totally understand everything that yeah. it's doing. Right. Or something that even you you want to keep it running and you want to turn it off and you want to stop it and then start it again. Like if you have ever installed, you know, a database engine on your host, you know that it's always running. So what I do when I run databases, for example, because they're always memory hogs and sometimes, you know, depending on what you're doing with them, might be CPU hogs. But um, if you spin it up in Docker, then you can just do a Docker stop, the name of that container, and then it stays there. And then later when you want to start it back up again, you just do Docker start. So in a lot of ways it replaces having to learn your host specific you know, commands for how to stop a service, how to restart a service. Like it, it all becomes kind of common because you're using Docker regardless of whether it's Windows, Mac, or Linux. So. Oh, for, uh, the uh, question was uh, actually about ARM64. Uh, it's great. There, all you have to do, um, basically, it's there's a lot of things there, but 20 seconds is uh, Docker. Docker doesn't necessarily have an official download, but if you just kind of search around, you will find several reliable builds. Um, one of them is uh, I'll find the link uh, and put it in chat, um, or ask me on Twitter if you want more information later. But um, there are a lot of oh, hyper. Hyper Riot or Hyper Pirate, Hyper Hyper Parrot, I think it might be the name of it. Um, they're they're a Raspberry Pi shop and they do a really good build of Docker. So there's not an I don't think there's an official build, but yeah, it works great. I run it on my Raspberry Pis upstairs. ARM64 is fantastic. That's awesome. Cool. So if you have a Raspberry Pi, then you are not left out of the game, which is cool because there are some stuff. There are still some things that don't run on the Raspberry Pi, like Windows. Yeah, yeah, and when you think about it. There's two parts to that of any different architecture. First, you have to be able to install Docker on it. And then secondly, you have to find containers that were built for that architecture. Well, with ARM, along with Windows and Linux, um, there are a lot of these official containers like Java or uh, Python or, or you know, Node.js. They have builds officially for that particular Linux or that particular architecture. So uh, ARM is one of them that's well supported. 
Sweet. So, all right, we are definitely over our time, but I, again, I've learned a ton about Docker, and I think that anyone who's a beginner probably understands where it fits into the stuff that they should probably learn, getting into security. Where would you recommend people go to stay up on Docker? Uh, of course, this would be a good time to mention your show, too. Right, right. I would say, well, uh, come hang out with me. Um, <laughs> So I don't think we're both on on YouTube at the same time. I think uh, I think you, you, I'm on Thursdays at 1 p.m. Eastern. So you can go to brett.live to if you if, because if you're here live watching this show, you might like other live shows. And I'm alive every week, and we take Q and A on Docker. It's very specific to Docker. Um, I'll put that y y URL in chat. Um, for the rest of everything I do, I I basically I'm an exclusive container person. So I talk Docker and all container tooling nonstop. Um, and I do it for a living now. It's my full-time gig. So if you want courses on all these container tools or more DevOps topics, if you're into DevOps, um, you would just go to my website. I mean, throw that link in there. Um, and I'm on all the things. We, we, you know, I'm on Twitch. Uh, I'm on Patreon now. We're getting ready to launch a Discord server. We have an open Slack server if you want to do Slack. I mean, there's just, you name it. Um, if you're talking about DevOps and containers, um, we're doing it. So yeah, come hang out with us. I'd love to, I'd love to get some great questions from y'all and hopefully, you know, we I can uh, come back here and we'll talk more security on this show. Absolutely. We'd love to have you back. And it sounds like there's a really great uh, kind of just community around containers where if you're interested in this sort of stuff, no matter if you're a developer or, for, or if you're a security person, there's lots of people in the community who are willing to talk to you kind of get you up to speed and there's lots of great content out there i was watching your youtube videos earlier and a lot of them explain some of these concepts very very well so if you're just getting into this sort of stuff and you want to kind of expand what you know then keeping up to date with it and attending one of these live q a's where you can ask questions great way to get started yeah yeah i i, I well thank you and i agree <laughs> Cool. So also thank you to everyone in our chat that asked questions. Thank you for Zam for uh, coming back over and over. Rolimbo for keeping up the energy. Uh, Michael uh, Bookby for all of your great questions. And in general, we really appreciate our live audience. So keep asking questions. If you have ideas for upcoming shows, please make sure to let us know. Uh, you can always reach me on Twitter at Cody Kinsey. I'd love to hear ideas for upcoming shows or questions you might have for an upcoming Q&A. And of course, if you have more Docker questions, you can feel free to ask me or Brett, I'm sure, as well. Uh, we yep. would love to hear yep. from you. Yeah, thanks again. Uh, and I'll see you all on the internet whenever, yeah, we'll next week. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Bye. Ciao.